It's now time for Mark Hankins, Faith for Every Nation. Mark and Trina train and equip leaders in every nation through church services, leadership conferences, mission trips, and media. Get ready for a direct and joyful message about how to grow in your faith and learn more about who you are in Christ. Now, let's join Mark and Trina. Welcome to the program today. We're going to go right into the Word of God and study what God has done for us in Christ. You know, when you hear the Word of God, not just like it's a word of a man, but it's really God talking to you. It makes all the difference. Yeah, Dad Hagen used to always say, <laughs> turn to your neighbor and say, the Bible is God talking, talking to me. me. Yeah. In other words, when you receive the Word, like God's talking to you, that God and His Word are one. There's tremendous power in the Word of God. When we receive it, Actually, James said, receive it with meekness. That means you humble yourself for fresh revelation, right. fresh application of the Word. And when you receive that Word appropriately, he said it gets engrafted on the inside of you. It becomes part of your life. Yeah, when it's engrafted, he says, and you become a doer of the Word, not just a hearer only. Now, I like to say it this way, that when you act on the Word of God, God makes himself responsible for your results. Wow, that's good. Yeah, the moment you act on the Word, then it's God's Word, and God watches his Word to perform it. So he's really waiting for us to speak his Word. Yeah, and what all's in the Word? Oh, I love 2 Peter chapter 1, where it says, according as his divine yeah. power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. In other words, in the mind of God, he has already given to us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of his word. That's right. But unless we open up the word of God, mm -hmm. begin to look at it, read it, believe it, it's left uh, without power. But once we do that, it becomes powerful in our lives, life changing. Yeah, actually the entrance of his word gives light. So as we study the word of God, you determine, I'm not just a hearer, I am a doer. I'm going to act on that word. And the moment you act yeah. on that word, it literally activates that promise because God's literally already done everything he's going to do about your salvation, your deliverance, yeah. your healing, your blessing in Christ through the blood of Jesus. God's already taken care of it and he gave us his word. He said, now when you act on that word, all of heaven will back you up. Right. And I'm telling you, the blessing and the power of God comes right as we act on the word of God. And God's thoughts are much higher than our mm -hmm. thoughts. His ways are higher. You always hear that, but he, it doesn't stop there. Yeah. It says he sends his word down like rain. Mm -hmm. And I believe today as you watch the program, there's a rain of the word of God coming in your life. It's changing your mm -hmm. mind. And there's some new uh, productivity in your life coming forth. New, new things healing. bring forth. Yeah. Yes, maybe your marriage, your family, your finances, a mm -hmm. way of thinking. God's word is his way of thinking. Yeah, we think God's thoughts. So I always like to say, if you want to study the mind of a genius, read the Bible yeah. because that's God's mind, God's thoughts. That's the mind of Christ. You can think just like God and you'll get some God kind of results. So we want to go right into the service today as we study the Word of God and you determine I'm going to act on that Word. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, you know this verse, He that is joined unto the Lord, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So now he's given you definition of what part of you actually is the new creature. He said, it's your spirit that was born again. You have the same body, come on, and you have the same mind. He said, but the real you, your spirit man, whoo, your spirit, you are a spirit. You have a soul and you just stand about it. But the real you, your spirit is joined to the master. Join to Christ. Amen. Amen. And he said, and you form one spirit. Amen. Amen. Join to him. So what does it mean to be in Christ as you're joined to him? In other words, you didn't get saved apart from him. You actually were joined to him. 
Now, the Amplified Bible will say it this way, if any man is in Christ, the Amplified will say, if any person is engrafted into Christ. Engrafted. In other words, Amplified says, all right, let's put this word here. If any person, when you make Jesus your Lord, you get engrafted into Christ. Amen. It's your spirit, come on, that is joined to him. Yes. Praise the Lord. Come on, so the devil's got to keep you in the natural or in the flesh. He cannot whip you the moment you step right over and start declaring who you are in Christ, spiritual reality. Your spirit is joined to or engrafted into Christ. So what does it mean to be engrafted into him? You just look up the dictionary and here's what it will say. Because they'll say, if you're going to graft a branch to a stock, then there must be a cut Grafted, produces different fruit, grows together, becomes strong. In other words, here's the way the dictionary said it. There is no grafting without wounding. So you say, now how did I get engrafted into Christ? Isaiah 53, what does it say? Surely, Isaiah 53, what does it say? Surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrow. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Are when he was wounded, you and I got engrafted. <laughs> and for a graft to take, there must be an identical wound or cut on the branch that there is on the stock. There must be an identical cut. If you want that, if you want that graft to take, if it's a slant on the branch, it's got to be a slant cut on the stock. If it's a groove on the branch, it's got to be a groove. And once it grows together, actually changes the genetics of that plant. So when Jesus was wounded, he was cut with the same identical condition. Oh, come on now. I said he was cut with the same identical condition that you and I have. He took our sin, our curse, our shame, and died our death. And when he was wounded, we were engrafted. So Paul says if you were there in his death, you had to be there in his resurrection. In other words, the significance of the resurrection is determined by the nature of his death. You know what that means. That means if, if, if his death was his death, then his resurrection was his resurrection. But if his death was our death, his resurrection was our resurrection. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Amen. Y'all still with me here? Amen. Yes, yes, yes. Woo. All right, go to Romans 6, 6 real quickly here. Knowing this, everybody say, I know this. Knowing this, Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man, ah, we're going to have to do some of that guy, huh? Knowing this, our old man, our old man, praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord, our old man, who's old man? Well, he's really talking about Adam and the race produced by Adam. Our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. Amen. What's he saying? Same thing, Romans 6, 6. Then he goes to reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. <laughs> Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Here's what it says in, in Romans 5, verse 20. Sin abound, grace did much more abound. One translation says, God's work in Christ far exceeds any damage done to us by Adam's fall. God's work in Christ far exceeds any damage done to us by Adam's fall. What happened on the cross, in the death, in the burial, and the resurrection of Christ? Paul said, we were there. Our old man, Paul said, I was there. 
we were there. And people say, how in the world were you there, Paul? I mean, we saw Jesus in the middle, thief on either side, but Paul said he was there. In other words, in the four Gospels, you see Jesus dying, Jesus buried, and Jesus raised in the four Gospels. But in Paul's letters, he said, we were there in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Or you could say it this way, the four Gospels tell you what happened to Christ, and Paul's letters tell you what happened in Christ. All right, here's the way I like to say it. The four Gospels give you a photograph of redemption, and Paul's letters give you an x-ray. In other words, the four Gospels show you a picture or show you what man saw, but Paul's letters show you what God saw. Or the four Gospels tells you what happened according to what man saw, but Paul's revelation tells you what happened, what God saw, what angels saw, what the devil saw yes. when Jesus yes. was raised from the dead. Thank you, Lord. Woo! Come on, to be found in him, that I may know him. And when he says to know Christ, he says, in the parameters of the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his suffering conformed to his death. In other words, what happened in the death and resurrection of Christ? What happened? In the spirit, x-ray. Matter of fact, most people will not send out an x-ray of their family for Christmas. Well, it's just so hard to recognize everybody. Listen. That doesn't mean that that's not them because the x-ray sees inside of them. Or what happened in the spirit. Woo! Praise the Lord. All right, so look at Romans 6, 6, and let me try to uh, get, get through this real quickly here. He says, our old man was crucified with him. <laughs> Other translations say, our old inherited self was crucified with him. A carpenter's translation says this, the old man, the unregenerate man who seemed so vigorous and healthy, he died. <laughs> Let's go over that one more time. The old man, the unregenerate man, he seemed so vigorous and healthy and he died. It had to be. He was a sinful fellow. It was useless to try to persuade him to become a little better, a shade or two less sinful. He had to be exterminated. <laughs> the root of his being was corrupt. So God said, we just had to kill him. <clears throat> I mean, when, when I was younger, I had an old car, but it's a rough old car. So I took it to a mechanic and I said, uh, what can I do to fix this car? And here's what he said. He said, uh, take the radiator cap off. Go find another car and put the radiator cap on that other car. <laughs> that means that, that's a bad car. So sometimes you go to God and say, God, how am I going to fix this? And he goes, ah, uh, we're just going to have to kill it. In other words, if God can't fix it, you ain't going to fix it. He said, I can't even use the radiator cap. In other words... All things pass away and everything becomes new. <laughs> Woo! You ought to get happy already. Say, well, I'm a new creature in Christ. Amen. <laughs> Here's another translation. Richard translation says, an executed criminal can perform no further crimes. <laughs> That's pretty good. One of my, one of my favorite jokes is, our favorite stories that, that a lot of people uh, laugh at about three weeks later was about <clears throat> the guy that got caught stealing horses, you know, in the West. Wild West got caught stealing horses. So they, you know, brought him into the city center. They're going to hang him. So they're fixing to hang him. And before they were going to hang him, they said, do you have any uh, last words? And he said, uh, this sure am going to teach me a lesson. <laughs> How I many know a hanging will real te really teach you a lesson? In other words, that will bring some behavior to a total end. <laughs> Probably all of his life, his mama said, this ought to teach you a lesson. He said, boy, this one's going to really teach me a lesson. 
So God took your old man, come on, the old person he used to be, and crucified him. So here's what Richard's translation says. Uh, an executed criminal can perform no further crimes. Therefore, by analogy, our former evil identities have been executed, so to speak. Our old rebel selves were exterminated. Yes. 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 Woo! Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. Our old inherited self. One translation says our old sin dominated personality was destroyed. Yes. Knowing this, in other words, two ordinances in the church, water baptism and what we call communion, and both show our identification with Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So he says, now your spirit is joined to Christ. Hallelujah. Your spirit's joined to Christ. You're in union with Christ. Everything Jesus has done for you. Now your confession of faith through the power of the Holy Spirit activates the reality of all that Christ has done for you. Right. Amen. 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 So now look at this. He says, my spirit's joined to Christ. Now look at 1 Corinthians 9, 27. And here's what he says. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. In other words, Paul says, we're talking about spirit, soul, and body. Paul says, I keep under my body. Well, apparently he's identifying I with who he is, the inner man. Spirit, I keep under my body, I bring it into subjection. Everybody say it. He said, that's many as I preach others, I myself would be disqualified. So Paul said, I keep under my body, bring it. All right? Now we, here he calls his body it. It. Right? So who's I? Well, I would be the inward man. All right, so now look at 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, where he says, I pray God your whole what? Spirit and soul and body. Now, here's why we want to look at this just for one minute, because each one of these are like uh, longer studies, but just for one minute, I'm going to look at this before we leave. He says, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body. Spirit, soul, and body. In other words, Paul, in his revelation, gives us more definition to what man is than any other writer in the Bible. Amen. He, he says, you're not just one part. He said, you're actually three parts. Spirit, soul, and body. I am a spirit, I have a soul, and I'm staying in this body. And he said, and God sanctify you wholly through the blood of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Ghost, he sanctifies and makes you complete or whole in Christ. Spirit, soul, and body. That means to be filled with the Holy Spirit means not only you washed in the blood, but your spirit, soul, and body come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Filled. Praise God. Amen. All right, now let me read this. This comes from James Stalker's book on the life of Paul, and I'll close with this. Can y'all can y'all handle this? Yes. All right, just let me know here. Here's what James Stalker says, the life of Paul, concerning spirit, soul, and body. He says, the nature of man, according to Paul, normally consists of three sections, spirit, soul, and body. In man's original constitution, these occupied definite relations of superiority and subordination to one another. The spirit being supreme, the body least important, and the soul occupying the middle position. Y'all still with me here? Yes. He said man originally was created. He said these three actually had the spirit was supreme. Body least important, soul in the middle. And here's what he says, but when Adam sinned, the fall not only did he die spiritually, but the fall disarranged the order. Uh-huh, that's why people have identity conflicts. He said the fall, not only did Adam die spiritually, but the fall messed up the order. And all sin consists in the usurpation by the body or the soul to the place of the spirit. 
He said, that's really the definition of sin. In fallen man, these two inferior sections of human nature, which together Paul calls the flesh, are that side of human nature that looks toward the world and time, have taken possession of the throne and completely rule the life. While the spirit, the side of man that looks toward God and eternity, has been dethroned and reduced to a condition of inefficiency and death. In other words, he says now when Adam died spiritually, come on, his spirit didn't cease to exist. He, he was in a spiritual death condition. But he said what happened is his body and his soul said, I'll take over here now. So now the man is ruled by his senses, by his feeling, by his intellect, by his mind, by sense knowledge. And the spirit has been reduced to inefficiency and death. But what happened when you got saved? When you made Jesus the Lord of your life, Christ restores the lost predominance of the spirit of man by taking possession of it by his own spirit. Woo! His spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God dwells in the human spirit, vivifying it and sustaining it in such growing strength that it becomes more and more the sovereign part of the human constitution. Amen, amen. And the man ceases to be carnal and becomes spiritual. He's led by the Spirit of God, becomes more and more harmonious with all that is holy and divine. Amen. All right, now listen to this, last paragraph. The flesh does not indeed easily submit to the loss of supremacy. <laughs> All right, one more time here. Y'all still with me? The flesh does not easily submit to the loss of supremacy. It clogs and obstructs the spirit and fights to regain possession of the throne. Paul has described this struggle in sentences of stark vividness in which all generations of Christians have recognized the features in their deepest experience. All right, simple as this. You make Jesus the Lord of your life. Come on, Spirit of God moves in you. Boy, you get happy at church on Sunday, right? You get full of the Word, full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> but your flesh, your intellect, your senses say, all right, I'll let you have Sunday. But Monday, you're going to do what I say. Try to block, because when you as a believer function and live in the realm and the reality of spiritual things, the devil can't whip you not one minute. Come on, but if he can pull you over into the natural, how you feeling? How's things look? Come on now, come on, how you feeling? And once he pulls you over there, whoop you every time. But if you say, no, I don't fight there. I only fight over here in the arena of faith. I fight over here in the arena of who I am in Christ. And you stay over there and you confess and declare who you are in Christ. You're watching Mark Hankins Ministries. Many Christians talk about what they are trying to be, what they need to be, and what they are going to be. Dress yourself up in the reality of who you are in Christ, and this new man is renewed by supernatural information, knowledge, or revelation. He said, when you start getting a hold of the Word concerning the new man, you dress yourself up in a new kind of thinking. God wants you to understand who you are and what you have right now in Christ. God is the master at changing people's identities. I'm not who my mama made me. I'm not who my past made me. I'm not who my problems made me. I'm not who circumstances made me. I am the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus. That's my identification. Learn who you are in Christ with the Power of Identification with Christ book and the three CD set, What Happened in Christ. Your gift of $25 or more will help Mark and Trina train pastors around the world. Order today. Call 318-767-2001 or visit markhankins.org. I trust you enjoyed the Word of God today. I always enjoy 
talking about God's Word and receiving God's Word because He sent His Word mm -hmm. and it healed them. In other words, there's healing literally in the Word of God. When we receive the Word, He sent His Word and it healed them. In other words, the Word has the same power as the very presence of Jesus Christ. He sent wow. His Word yes. and it healed them. We know that from Matthew chapter 8 when the centurion said, Speak the Word only and my servant shall be healed. In other words, God's Word in your mouth is just as powerful as God's Word in His mouth. I heard Reinhard Bonnke yeah. say that years ago. I like to say when you take God's Word and put it in your mouth, then that's mouth to mouth resuscitation from God. You literally breathe in the <laughs> life of God. And so the enemy wants to separate you from that Word. But if you determine, I'm going to stay in the Word, I'm going to act on the Word, no matter how I feel or how things look, then literally that Word will produce supernatural results exactly. in your life. You know, Paul said to hold fast to the profession of our faith. And what, one of the struggles that we have is holding fast. But the more we hear the Word of God, the more natural it we will become because our minds will be renewed to the Word of God. Amen. Hold fast means hold on to your confession of faith without wavering. In other words, keep agreeing with God. You may say, well, it looks like I'm not telling the truth. Well, for one thing, God Himself cannot lie. He's no. telling the truth. So if you're in agreement with God, God's Word in your mouth has creative power when you're speaking that Word. So hold fast to the confession of what Christ has done for you, who you are in Christ, and what the Word of God does in you mightily just continues to say, I agree with God. I am who God says I am. I have what That's God right. says I have. I can do what God says I can do. So he says hold fast to it means there may be a time of adversity a right. time of challenge. Don't let go of it. Don't forget about it. Be conscious of the importance of your confession of faith in Christ, in His blood, in His name. And you'll find that word of work mightily. And we've got some powerful message and we've got some powerful books. You've got to get this offer today and feed on the Word of God day and night. And wow, you'll get some supernatural results. So you've got to get the Word of God. So I encourage you to get this order today. Many of the nations we go to have very little access to the teaching of the Word of God. So we not only go there, but we translate and distribute our books so that pastors and leaders can continue to feed their faith. The Lord continues to open the doors in new countries and languages for our books to be distributed. Our vision is to have the message of faith translated in 100 different languages. We believe if we'll do our part in broadcasting on television, through website, social media, and the app, publishing books and CDs, that God will do His part and make sure that the message lands in the right place at the right time. Would you like to join us in this mission to strengthen the body of Christ internationally? Your monthly offering will help pastors and leaders around the world. Call 318-767-2001 or visit markhankins.org to become a World Missions Partner today. Download the Mark Hankins Ministries app today. On the app, you can watch our TV show, listen to the radio program, read the daily devotional, and see where Mark and Trina will be. You can stay connected to Mark Hankins Ministries wherever you are. Download the app today on any iOS, Android, or Windows device. Simply search Mark Hankins Ministries and start feeding your faith today.